All right, I want to uh, talk to you about the training of a neural network. And uh, this training of a neural network, it's easy to write down and uh, hard to do right. So, um, on the previous uh, slide, we had uh, seen that what is a standard architecture in a deep neural network is that we um, take some input and we transform it linearly and this would be then the result or the activations or the features in my first channel and uh, these are subject to another linear operation and another nonlinearity. These would be my activations after the second layer. And uh, then we go on with these nested computations or nested dependencies until we have in the end a sigma um, W, maybe let's say we have capital L layers and the um, result is then my estimate. So this is, I'm going to call this here the, you know, I fitted a non a neural network is nothing other than a nonlinear function I fit into my data. And my nonlinear function. Uh, accept some input and it depends on parameters WL. Sorry, too little space here. All right, and uh, here I used a um, subscript, I used a subscript I. And uh, this time <clears throat> I was not referring to a single pixel, uh, but this time I was referring to a particular image. Yeah, so this would be an input image. And in fact, uh, this is here my input image number i. And then um, this is how my neural network transforms my input image. Um, this function f, depending on the task, can be a single number, like it could be a number of pedestrians in this image, or a number of cells in this image, or it could be uh, um, a vector of responses. It could be an output image where I have indicated for each pixel what is its class. So f can be a scalar or a vector or something even more complicated. Um, so this is an output function of my input. And uh, at train time, um, I am trying to figure out what are the good parameters that will make this output useful. And an output is useful if the output that the new network gives is close to the desired output, which in my uh, training set are given as targets. Yeah, so this would be uh, the desired target um, for input i. Or I could have called this desired output, the desired output um, for my input image number i. This is the desired output. This is what I found. And the discrepancy between what I should have found and what I did, found, what I did find, this discrepancy is measured by the loss. This loss is summed over all images in my training set script T. And at train time, I'm trying to minimize this empirical loss by finding a good set of parameters. This is train time. And then at test time, well, I just use my neural network with the parameters that I found. Now, so this gives me a set of optimal parameters. Uh, calling here them uh, 
I could put a star or a hat or something. Um, this is the result of my optimization procedure, these optimal parameters. And these are the parameters uh, that I'm then going to use at test time um, to process any input. Yeah? Um, so, you know, this equation, uh, in a way, it says it all, and in a way, it says nothing, uh, because there are many, uh, many, many choices here. I mentioned these terribly many um, hyperparameters that users have to choose, and let's, uh, I'm going to discuss a few choices with you now, and this is the last thing we're going to do today. Um, so first, when we say we compute this function f, um, the obvious choice that we have to make is, well, what's the architecture? Um, so in particular, an important choice is to make what are the dimensions of these uh, matrices w. If you um, remember the image I drew previously, I said, here's my input image, and then I'm going to transform it linearly and I'm going to get a stack of uh, activation maps of features. I said capital K. But, you know, K is what? Should it be, you know, should it be 32? Maybe. Um, but then I have W2. And, uh, you know, here I could say K1 is 32. Now the question is, well, what is K2? Is it 64? Or is it also 32? Or what is it? Uh, and it goes on. And there's the question, OK, well, should this depend just on the input of the previous layer? Or should it also depend on that? Um, and uh, you know, there are a zillion more choices you can uh, make with your architecture. And uh, you will see a little bit of that design space when we talk about the unit uh, next time. Um, so there is this huge design space, and uh, by just selecting some of these hyperparameters, you're only picking one point in that design space, and who knows if it's optimal. Um, now, uh, to restrict your freedom of choice a little bit, um, the GPU manufacturers are helping you uh, by giving only so and so many gigabyte of RAM. Um, to the GPU that you can afford. And that means in your design space, um, there are just certain things which are not possible. Yeah? So you're not going to be able to afford um, 3,000 uh, channels here, even if maybe this would be a great network, um, just because it won't fit into your RAM. Yeah? So out of the hypothetical design space, um, there is an envelope of uh, what can you uh, afford to compute. But inside this envelope, uh, it's not really, you know, clear where you want to go. And uh, there are meta optimization strategies um, that try and find not just the right parameters, but also um, the, the sweet spot in architecture space. Uh, but unfortunately, um, you normally have to be an owner of uh, a data center um, to be able to um, you know compute these things because inevitably it means uh, testing out many architectures and here testing out means training them until the end and seeing how well they are doing before you move in architecture space so fundamentally it's an important uh, it's, a, it's an expensive endeavor good so this is architecture um, Beyond the question of uh, you know what input goes where and how many channels, um, I mentioned here amongst many considerations, but I mentioned here um, normalizations, um, which uh, turned out to also make a huge difference to how easy it is to train deep neural networks. So I mentioned that uh, going from a, a sigmoid activation function to a ReLU made a huge difference in how how well or how quickly you can train a network or how deep a network you can train. The, the number of layers is what we, is how we count the depth of the network. Uh, but actually these normalizations, um, such as uh, a batch norm or group norm, um, they have also been making a huge practical difference. And I'll show you a picture about these later. Um, 
So these were just a few words about architecture, uh, more next week. Uh, then there is the loss function. Um, there are a um, few, well, popularly used loss functions. Of course, for more complex tasks, you have more complex loss functions. Um, but if you want to work on a standard classification problem, um, then the loss function you typically use, um, excuse me, um, is uh, cross entropy. If you want to um, work on a regression task, Um, then a typical loss function is just uh, the sum of the squared deviations. Um, if there are many things to say about this, for example, if you have a uh, strong imbalance, if one of your uh, classes appears much more frequently uh, than the other, um, then maybe you want to use um, things like uh, the servants and dice loss, and there are many, many others. Um, also, it can be really useful um, to, um, besides the primary task, for example, solving a semantic segmentation problem, um, to solve side tasks. So, for example, uh, let's say you want to train a neural network that uh, finds things in a video. then one of the um, side tasks that you could train in your network on is to always predict the next frame given the last few frames. And now at the face of it, it has nothing to do with the, the primary task. However, if the neural network manages to do this well, then you can argue it has learned something about the nature of this data set. It has learned something about the nature of these videos. And that often helps stabilize the training task, um, in particular if you have too little training data. And I will also say more about that. And for the side tasks, it's especially important to have ones uh, that don't need extra ground truth, uh, because, well, um, training data can be hard, or let's say training images can be easy, can be hard to get by, uh, usually rather easy, because there are plenty of images and plenty of videos on the World Wide Web. But the ground truth is the tricky bit, and this is usually the, the limited quantity. And that's much more true if you work not on pedestrian detection, for which there are you know, many benchmarks with big uh, ground truth out there. But if you work, um, let's say, on biological problems, um, for which there's no ground truth for the particular kind of data set or question uh, that you have. Good. So this is, uh, uh, there is, a great variety of choices in what loss function you're going to use. Then I mentioned uh, the sum over training images. Well, you know, when you have uh, training data, there's a typical split, a split in uh, a training, uh, a test and validation, um, or at least uh, training and uh, test data. Um, so train is what you train on. Uh, test is where you want to see, okay, before I roll it out, you know, what's the estimate I should give to the number of false alarms, uh, number of false positives or number of false negatives. Um, and well, you always want as much training data as you can possibly uh, get. Um, however, uh, usually that is not enough. And uh, there are certain plausible ways of how to increase the amount of training data that you have. For example, if you work on image classification, and uh, admittedly image classification that you know tends to be a problem that was an absolute focus of interest uh, in the years 2012, 13, 14, or now it's considered by and large as a solved problem. Um, but image classification is a task of, for example, saying, answering the question, is there a cat in the image? Um, now, for that, you will have training data, images with cats, images without cats, and then this uh, one bit per image to say, was there a cat or was there no cat? And well, if you have an image with a cat looking this way, 
then you might as well flip the image and you obtain an image with a cat looking that way. Yeah? And now you suddenly have uh, two training images um, that, you know, of course, are trivially related. One is just uh, uh, the, the mirror image of the other one. But yet, you know, they, uh, they look different locally. Yeah? So if you think of the, the filters that you're going to train and so on, it does make a difference if the cat looks this way or if the cat looks that way. And um, so to flip images, or here I wrote crops. So crops means that uh, you are given um, the whole image. Uh, and then inside this image, you uh, find overlapping or non-overlapping crops, or maybe these can be bigger or smaller. Um, so for example, if you have a bounding box annotating you that um, there was a human uh, here in the image, then uh, to train your network to be able to detect humans at multiple scales, um, you can uh, take multiple boxes and always bring them to a normalized size. Huh? So let's say you interpolate this to 256 squared and you interpolate that to 256 squared. Now that we know how to do interpolation, right? And we inter or we interpolate or subsample this to be uh, the size 256 squared, because your most of these networks they always only accept input of a fixed size, and uh, this means that you have now uh, artificially created a few images in which uh, the human apparently, you know, had different sizes. Huh? So the one where you upsampled a lot, the human was this big. And then you had another one where the human was that big, uh, and so on. And then you also take crops where the human is uh, maybe not in the center of the image, but in the bottom left corner. So you create an image where you know your human now effectively is here, and so on. Yeah? So uh, this is a way of artificially augmenting the amount of training data that you have. You can also add noise. Uh, you can uh, distort your images uh, elastically, for example. You can change the color content on the image. You can make them brighter, darker, whatnot. All of these are super important to, um, to get uh, good performance in the real world. All right, um, this was about the loss. And uh, finally, um, the optimization itself is a formidable problem because you are uh, trying to train something um, a modern Networks have millions or literally billions of parameters. It's incredible. And uh, so you are uh, trying to move about in a million or billion dimensional space and trying to find the sweet spot. Sweet spot being defined as the one with a low loss. And uh, that is a computationally very hard problem. It's also a problem where um, great progress has been made, uh, much of it empirical, I have to say. Um, and uh, yeah, I will say a few more words about that in detail uh, or, or next time because uh, we should stop now and it's a really important topic in practice. Good, I'm stopping the recording and asking if you're going to have any questions. <laughs>